Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Last week, we dove into the conversion of the Apostle Saul slash Paul. Today, we're leaping forward to Acts chapter 20, and Paul is on the back end of his third missionary journey. Now, Paul has spent a lot of time and love in establishing this new congregation of Ephesus. In fact, Paul was at Ephesus for over three years. Um, My phone's not connecting, so you might have to, for the time being, go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, In Ephesus, Paul had performed many miracles, and we're told, and I'm sure he healed even some beloved members of the congregation. Paul had to also deal with some real serious opposition in Ephesus. Paul was preaching Jesus as the way and the one that people should commit their lives to following and who would dramatically change their lives. But Paul's message and the changed lives of Christians threatened a huge portion of Ephesus' economy. And that was the business of the temple of Artemis. And this was no small business. The temple of Artemis, or Diana, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In fact, Antipater of Sidon, who's the guy who came up with the famous list, he ends his list by saying, But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted um, up to the clouds... Those other marvels lost their brilliance. And I said, lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. Well, apparently Paul was not quite as impressed with the temple of Artemis as uh, Antipater. And he wasn't too worried about its prophets either. He um, unapologetically preached Jesus as the way, and all other ways as bankrupt. So a leading businessman, a man by the name of Demetrius, instigated a riot because the gospel was bad for his business. The angry mob got so, well, riotous that it had to be quieted, in fact, by a city official. Um, And this city official reminded the crowds that Rome would be none too lenient about punishment if rioting in Ephesus got bad enough that Rome had to intervene. As Paul wraps up his third missionary journey, um, he stops at Ephesus to say goodbye to his friends and gospel partners, who were told were specifically the elders, of the different house churches of Ephesus. Now, Paul was, he's going to Jerusalem. Like I said, this is at the tail end of his mission, but going back to Jerusalem is very dangerous for Paul because just generally speaking, Jerusalem is, we know throughout the scriptures, where God reveals himself. But Jerusalem is also where God's messengers are rejected or even killed. And in fact, this will prove to be very problematic when Paul arrives in Jerusalem. And if not for some quick thinking, an eavesdropping youth, and most importantly, the Holy Spirit, Paul would have been killed in Jerusalem. The problem uh, is that Jerusalem's Pharisees have hounded Paul across the Mediterranean. Uh, these, These Pharisees have caused Paul more problems than pagans or pagan rulers. In fact, they have sent people to follow Paul and disrupt him, uh, and that's no small feat in those days. They, they would travel for weeks just to, just to stop Paul from preaching. And, and both Paul and the Ephesians know at this point that they may not see each other again this side of eternity. In fact, Paul speaks... Uh, with conviction, saying, this is the last time you're going to see my face. 
and all of this, I'm trying to set up what Paul says here. If Paul's missionary, third missionary journey was a movie, well then, what happens here is, it's the heartfelt speech before the most important moment of the movie. It's the, it's the quiet moment set aside to make sure everyone knows what's going on at this pivotal moment and why. And Paul's heartfelt speech could be summarized in uh, three words that we talked that Laura Lee talked about: confidence, conviction, and compassion. Um, Paul starts off by reminding the elders of his work among them, and that's that Paul has fearlessly proclaimed the gospel because the message was too important to compromise on, and it's for the same reason because of his confidence that Paul is fearlessly going to Jerusalem, even though that's exactly what his enemies want. Um, Paul is telling them this because he wants them to share in his confidence. You see, the Ephesians are worried and afraid of what will happen to Paul in Jerusalem. And Paul knows and and says, I don't know if I'm going to survive this trip, but he goes nevertheless because Paul has a confidence in God's plan of salvation that cannot be shaken by thunderous riots in Ephesus, or angry men following him around the Mediterranean, or devious plots even inside the heart of Jerusalem. Now, we think it's only fair to recognize, when I try to make this point, that the early church, they had a lot more problems to to deal with than we did. It was way more difficult for them. And yet, you know, we, we still encounter anger, and bitterness to the message and words of Jesus still today. Now, I think, again, it's always important, I think, for Christians to be willing to admit fault. Um, Sometimes the truth is we've been uncharitable, or we've been bitter, or we've been self-righteous, as the the outside world accuses us of. Um, Sometimes we've earned our enemies, or we could learn from our mistakes, at least. But, but even with that being admitted, sometimes people oppose the message of Jesus because it's not good for their business or because its message contradicts what they are already committed to. However, Paul encourages the Ephesians not to worry about all this opposition. I mean, did you hear that? Don't fret or worry about opposition to the gospel. You know, you often might hear coaches say, we need to worry more about ourselves than honor our opponent. And and what they mean when they say that is that a team must focus on the specific things it needs to do, um, and that's where its most important focus needs to be on. Now, you certainly may plan and adjust But if you're playing a team, you can't create a new offense in three or four days. And you can't create a new team. Who you have and what you do is what you got. You've got to focus on doing it well. In many cases, in fact, if you do your job well, it won't matter what the other team does. And sometimes we as Christians need that reminder. It's fine to be aware of trends in our world and and to be wise and and know what's going on, and also to be strategic. But we also need to remember we don't fight with the weapons of the world. Rather, we put on the armor of God. Truth, faith, prayer, salvation, forgiveness. These kinds of things are always the church's best solution and strategy. The best solution to evil is not to plot more evil or to overcome it. It's not to fight fire with fire, but rather to overcome evil with good. Um, You see, the reason we can do that is because we can be confident that God's plans have a better chance of success than those who oppose the gospel. Uh, Confidence in Christ leads to conviction, which we could say a couple different ways, which means staying true to what you believe It also means acting on what you believe. You believe something to be true, and therefore you act on it. Conviction implies believing something even in the face of opposition or hardship. 
conviction is saying, I'm standing by what I said, even if you disagree with me. Paul knows that outside influences, even false prophets and leaders, will try to lead the Ephesians to, to believe and live, and live as if some other message than the gospel is more important. He says there will even be wolves from among you trying to distract you, trying to use you uh, to feed themselves, not to help you. And Paul especially wanted the Ephesian church to have conviction because they lived in a very pagan city. He knew firsthand by his own experiences in Ephesians that the way of Jesus was not always welcomed with open arms there. Sometimes it wasn't even tolerated. Paul had been the example of fearless conviction and commitment even in the face of danger. Paul reminds the leaders um, that now they would be the examples. You see, Paul's leaving, so that means Paul would no longer be there to rally the church to preach the gospel. When the church faced hardship or persecution, now the local leaders in Ephesus would need conviction to do something themselves. We all, I think, start off as Christian in our Christian walk looking up to fellow Christians. Maybe it's uh, family members, maybe a mother, or, or others in the church, or Christian leaders who we learn humility or faithfulness or conviction or confidence from. But there comes a day for all of us when we are called to be the example that others need. A day when we are called to say, I'm willing to suffer loss for the sake of the gospel. I will say what I believe even if others disagree. Conviction says the gospel and the salvation of all are too important to compromise on. I must speak and act with conviction. Oh, Paul ends his speech with the most important point, that the Ephesian elders are to have compassion. Because, right, lots of people, lots of people have conviction and confidence. But simply having conviction and confidence doesn't mean somebody's worth listening to or praiseworthy. Paul himself, right, he had all kinds of conviction and confidence when he was arresting and breathing out murderous threats against Christians. Conviction and confidence draw attention often from the world, but they themselves on their own are not necessarily good. Paul did not yet know the love of Christ, and his conviction and confidence led him to do some truly terrible things. Paul knows this, right? He has been completely changed. We talked about that last week. His attitude is dramatically, and his life has dramatically changed. So he wants to make sure the Ephesian church knows this as well. Confidence and conviction are not enough. We also need compassion. He hopes that the church will care for one another. He tells them not to forget about the weak, but to care for them. His last words, recorded words are, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, it's, it's easy for leaders to talk about conviction and confidence, but just as important is our compassion. And our conviction and our confidence are not, I'm not saying they're negated, or nullified by our compassion. However, our compassion certainly shapes how we express our conviction and confidence. We look to our Savior as always. Jesus had confidence in God's plan, and he was so convicted that he was willing to bet his life on it. What's more, we know that Jesus was consistently compassionate to the hurting, to the disciples and to the world. It's the example of Jesus that Paul is seeking to follow. Christ's ministry, death, and resurrection are why Paul is so confident, convicted, and compassionate. Paul went from being willing to kill those who he disagreed with to being willed to be killed at their hands so that others might hear the gospel and receive salvation from Christ. And so we too, we are confident that God's plans will succeed despite whatever suffering or opposition we might face. And we are convicted, and so we must act and live out our faith in word and deed 
And of course, we are compassionate as Christ's compassion flows through us. In Jesus' name, amen.